forget we're playing on video. Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Anna, a clinical psychology doctoral intern. And today is gonna to be kind of unusual. I'm just gonna be ranting about work-life balance. Now that I'm working full-time in the workforce, I think I'm starting to understand a lot of people's concerns about work-life balance. It drives me up a wall when people talk about reducing stress or taking self-care when that is not anywhere near enough for a lot of people. For example, there are a lot of health concerns that are caused by high stress. And if you develop a health concern like that and you go to the doctor and they have a chat with you about what's going on for you, and it seems like stress might be a trigger, of course they say, well, you know, you have to manage your stress. You have to reduce your stress. Just to manage your stress is not feasible advice for most people. For instance, I have a health concern that I think I finally have under control that is caused by stress and anxiety, and I have taken all the steps to resolve it. You know, I've been in therapy for years, I have tried medications, I eat healthy, I work out, I take all the supplements I need, but even when I was doing all those things, it didn't necessarily solve the issue because you can't completely eliminate stress. And you know, for someone that has like an anxiety disorder, telling them to manage their anxiety is just not helpful because they already know, they're likely already taking steps to try to manage their anxiety. You can't just tell someone to get over a diagnosis that they have. They have to actually learn to live with it, to accept it about themselves and to come to terms with what they can do, what's within their control and to sort of release what's outside of their control. And I do think it's interesting. I hear from a lot of different people in a lot of different fields that you know, upper management or corporate or their managers tell them to have work-life balance. And they're telling them this and taking time up from their workday telling them this, all the while knowing that this person probably doesn't have time or can't afford the self-care that they need because of the parameters of the job itself. I truly believe that most jobs these days, you know, like a regular nine to five, 40 hour work week, simply do not give you enough hours in the day to practice self-care. And I hear this from clients all the time, this idea of like, what do I do? Like, I'm trying to keep up with all my responsibilities. A lot of people have school, multiple jobs. They have to make dinner. They have to clean their home. How are they meant to also have a semblance of a social life and to do things that they love, that give them passion? I'm a big proponent of the idea that if you are working so much that you only have time to come home at the end of the day, make dinner, watch a couple episodes of TV, and then go to sleep, that's not a life. You know, and especially if your work doesn't allow you to do the things that actually revive you, things like working out five times a week, which we know is integral to being healthy, eating when you're hungry because you have, let's say, you know, something that requires you to be on the go, like all the time that you're at work, journaling. If you don't have time to do these very basic things in your day-to-day -day life, then your job is imposing a certain schedule on you that is not making it realistic for you to be able to take care of yourself. And when they say you should take care of yourself, it's really just to appease you or to make sure that you're somewhat taking care of your needs so that you can continue to perform your job, but it sounds fake because they're not actually taking measures to make sure that you have a life outside of work. I hear a lot of people these days saying it's a capitalism thing, you know, it's just this is what life under capitalism is like, this is what happens when you have a country that's born of white supremacy. You know, I don't know a lot about economic systems and so I try to kind of stay out of that because it's just not my field of expertise. But I can say it's definitely not just a capitalism thing. My parents, having grown up in a communist dictatorship, experienced this and worse. You know, they had to work six days a week. They weren't getting the payment that they deserved. There was a lot of corruption. It's not just limited to capitalism or white supremacy. It's about power in general. Anytime there's a system where there are people who are in power who have to benefit from people further down the hierarchy, there's likely going to be an abuse of that power. Capitalism is just a symptom of a disease that really affects almost every part of the world. I 
feel like the most important thing when you decide what career you want to go into is deciding what is something that will nourish you, that will energize you when you do it, that you're truly passionate about. You know, I can tell you for me, I love clinical psychology. I love giving therapy. I love the career that I've chosen. But if I'm being honest with myself, creative writing is really what I would do every second of the day if I could. Which, by the way, my novel has been ready for a few months now. I'm in the um, agent querying phase and so hopefully I'll be able to publish that maybe next year so keep a lookout for that. If you have a job that is truly your passion that you love doing that you love going to work every day it's not going to feel like work and it's going to feel like fulfillment to you and so if you're in the phase where you're trying to decide what to do with your career that is the way I see it the best advice that I can give you is figure out what you can't get enough of and try to turn that into a career. The issue is that's not realistic for everyone because there are things like, you know, the stereotype that, well, if you want to be a writer, you're just going to die of starvation because the reality of it is that writing is a very competitive industry. Or let's say you already have chosen a career. You can't afford to go back to school, suddenly switch lanes. There are certain things gatekeeping you from the career that you want. It's not realistic for everyone to do what they're passionate about. And it's true that most people do jobs. They don't have like professional careers that they're so passionate about. They're just trying to make a living. But I don't think that it should be a privilege to do what you love. I think it should be a right because like I've been talking about, if you are doing something eight hours a day or more, depending on how many jobs you have to keep, what sort of schedule you have, then you have no time really to live outside of that. If your life is going to be your job, it better be something you love. I hear people talking about sort of two approaches to doing a job that you're not passionate about. Some people say, put in as much work as you're paid for. And some people say, put in as much work as you want to grow in this position. So for example, if you're you know, at McDonald's, not super passionate about it, not getting paid very well, putting in the bare minimum, putting in you know minimum wage, whatever they're paying you for. Or for example, if you are in a company where, you know, it's a startup, you're pretty new there, you're young, you have your career ahead of you, really want to go up in the company, it makes sense that you would want to prioritize the company's well-being, stay after hours, do whatever it takes to get your sales, you know, all the stuff that is associated with making you look good, growing the company so that the company can then ultimately reward you. I have to be honest, I've never been of the mindset that you should put in the least amount of effort possible. I do believe in taking the path of least resistance, you know, if there are shortcuts taking them. But I believe that it's very important for us to all be very competent and skilled at our jobs because without that, the world would crumble. You know, we would go to a restaurant or to a store or we would buy a piece of furniture and everything would be just terrible. No one would do their job well. I say this as someone who has noticed these sorts of shifts happening in recent times since the pandemic. You know, a lot of people were laid off of their jobs when COVID first hit, and then companies hired new people who weren't as good at their jobs. And I think at least in like customer service industries, we definitely see that it's resulting in people not doing their job very well and everyone being just sort of frustrated with it. And like, take me for instance, I am nine months away from being a doctor of psychology and I get paid, I calculated it's about minimum wage. This is my ninth year of being in training to become a psychologist and I make minimum wage, working eight to five. If I were to put in the bare minimum effort that I'm being paid for, I would not be able to go up in my field. I would not be able to pass internship, to get my doctorate, to have the skill set to become a good clinical psychologist in the future, that does not benefit me. You know, like I understand that the internship process in this country is very exploitative. I am fully aware of it. We talk about it a lot at internship. It's a systemic issue. It's not something that's, you know, the fault of the specific people that hired me. But I understand that it doesn't benefit anyone if I suddenly put in the bare minimum effort. It's most certainly not going to benefit me. So I do try to be as good as possible at my job. I do try to expand my horizons for the future and to be as productive and skilled as possible. And I have seen for some people that works. Of course, the issue is it depends on the situation. You know, like if you're in a very exploitative industry where there's no end in sight, no sign that you're really going to start to receive what you deserve. If you've been at a company for like 
five, 10 years doing the best you can, they're not paying you what you deserve to be paid. There's no sense that they're actually going to follow through with their promises. Then yeah, maybe it doesn't benefit you to continue putting in 100% effort. So I think we also need to be realistic that this idea of like, well, if you just overwork yourself to death, you're going to make it. That's not always the case. In certain circumstances, perhaps it's true, but not all. I just feel like we shouldn't be living to work. There's this idea that's very common in psychology and I'm sure in other fields as well, that like you have to merge your professional and personal identity, that basically your identity as a psychologist in training has to be who you are. And I really struggle with this because I think we're all so multifaceted. We all behave differently based on environment, based on setting. And it makes no sense for us to center ourselves as primarily workers, producers, because it's very dehumanizing. And anytime we are dehumanized, it makes us vulnerable to exploitation. I'll be honest, I don't live to work, not at all. I love the weekends, I love the evenings, I get fulfillment out of my job, I like feeling good at my job, but my end goal is not to be the best worker that I can be. My end goal is to be a person who's also very good at what she does. You know, like I want to be a wife, a mother, a grandmother, a writer, a gardener, a homeowner. These are all things that I want for myself. I'm not just a psychologist in training. We can't recreate a system on our own. And I think it's very easy to feel helpless and powerless when facing these sorts of realities. Something that I like to do when this is the case is to draw a circle and inside the circle, I put everything that's within my control and outside of the circle, everything that's outside of my control. And after I've depleted my mind of all these things that are inside and outside of my control, I look at it, I look at have I done everything that's within my control and can I release what's outside of my control because there's nothing that I can do about it. The worrying about it or pouting about it is not going to change the reality of the situation. So what's within your control is going to vary greatly depending on your specific circumstances. For me, I can tell you what's been within my control is having this YouTube channel, being able to put in about six hours a week into writing, creating and editing this content has basically like doubled the salary that I'm able to have and allowed me to live independently. Finding time during vacations to do creative writing, you know, even a little bit here and there has over the years added up to about like four books worth of writing. Maybe finding somewhere cheaper to live, opening up my own private practice, thinking about moving back to Europe. All these are ways that I'm considering what's within my control to make this easier on me, to give me more independence. For you, it could mean unionizing. I hear that's huge in terms of advocating for your rights. Going on strikes, finding passive ways of income, such as a YouTube channel, an Etsy shop, whatever it may be. Purchasing property, if you can afford it, putting aside money every month to save for a property or for a saving for something like your kid's college tuition in the future. You know, even though I just said I make minimum wage, I still make sure to put $100 aside every month for my retirement. It's definitely not feasible if you're below the poverty line, if you're literally just struggling to go month to month or week to week. But if you are even a little bit just above what you can live on, it is possible to put aside money every month. But ultimately, none of these are going to be useful for people that need them most, that are literally just trying to stay afloat, that don't have time or energy to unionize, that can't afford to put aside money every week because they're still trying to figure out how to put food on the table for their kids. It's very difficult and I definitely don't have the answers. I just thought I would hop on here and talk about a few points that have been on my mind as a way to hopefully validate you if you relate to any of these and also maybe give you a sense of how to reframe it in order to move forward. Let me know what your thoughts are on this topic and I'll see you in a few days.